Alright, so let's start. So we're doing Extinction 2. We're going to cover part of what we did, uh, part of what we couldn't finish last time, and then talk about other Extinction issues. Okay. Um, uh, clickers, you'll talk to me about uh, the file genetics lecture. Your, your scores weren't recorded, so I'll fix that for everyone. Um, and we'll have those more clickers today, and so we can see if it works. Okay. All right. So, first. Every year, millions of dollars are spent protecting one of wildlife's most treasured endangered species, the giant panda. So, when British naturalist Chris Packham suggested recently that maybe we're spending too much effort and money on a species not fit to survive, it sparked some controversy. He joins us now from Norfolk, England. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, Shara. You had to expect that you were going to get a little backlash. Did you expect the backlash that's been coming? I understand there's been hate mail and everything else. I've been shouted at in the street. I have a, an email box full of controversy. But I've also managed to stimulate what I think is a very important debate. I picked on the poor old panda, not because I don't love it as much as you do and, and all of the people out there in the United States. I picked on it because it cost us a tremendous amount of money. And what I wanted to do was create a, a constructive debate about how we might spend conservation's limited pot of cash in the near future. With the onset of climate change, we're going to see an, a massive increase in pressure on the world's flora and fauna. And I want us, like most conservationists want us, to be in the, the best place to apply our science, our technology, and our funding to best affect that conservation. The reason I picked on the, the panda, you've already touched upon, it's a highly specialized animal. It lives in a very narrow range. It lives in a very overpopulated uh, country where the population is, is continuing to grow. It's going to be very expensive to look after, and it's proved that already. I'm merely suggesting that we conduct a, an audit and think about how we spend our money to best preserve the world species. And I'm very, very pleased that you've asked me on today. I'm very pleased that the debate has spread across the Atlantic to the United States, where a lot of the pioneers of the conservation movement are, are continuing to work. So. So those of you who saw the video earlier when we're coming in, I mean, we had the trouble even mating. Right? So it's something that, like, a species at risk, you know, we have limited conservation dollars. How do you decide where to put conservation dollars into saving species? Right. So we'll talk about some methods for that later on in the class. We want to sort of start thinking about, you know, one way is to sort of do triage and say, let, let some, you know, cute megafauna die and save, you know, five beetles <coughs> instead. Okay. But first, last time we were at this stage, talking about selectivity of mass extinctions. And we went around, and you folks came up with this list. Okay, So things that might be under selected against during extinction. So symbiosis, um, big body size. Um, you want to, so yeah, you, you do want efficient energy use. Um, marine might be more stable than terrestrial, with, with exceptions. Short generation time is good. Polymorphism is good. Um, depends on sort of way you assist or resting stage you can wait out a bad situation is good. Mobility, so you can go to where you're adapt where you can survive well. Um, behavioral flexibility, uh, not being sensitive to group size, uh, being lucky, right? so being creative with what's happening next, and perhaps um, polygamy. Okay. And so people have actually done studies about this and papers about this. And so here's a paper by McKinney, who's actually in the geology department here, um, <coughs> looking at uh, traits that might affect, ex affect extinction, right? And so it's a mixture of individual traits, okay, that affect abundance of individuals or probably in the death of individuals, okay? And then we have the ability to the species, and we have economic selectivity, so selectivity of Maybe things that um, live in North America do better than live in the Yucatan. Okay. <coughs> and so here's a summary table of all these factors that are increased extinction risk, both in modern extinctions and in fossil extinctions. Um, so, um, you can have evidence of uh, common body temperature, especially diet, high protein levels, 
and the websites that like Bright Side like to talk about result in modern digital transmission rate and population. Um, and then there's you know, A and R. So a lot of these questions come back to thinking about log logistic growth, okay, which is this equation. Okay. That's good shorthand biologists have, R versus K species, that sort of thing. Who's heard of this before? Yeah, yeah. Is this clear to everyone? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. And this is a different, uh, <coughs> okay. a different study of what's happening right now. Um, and so, among species that are at risk today. So, what things are doing poorly? You know, large size, like parents and kids. What things are doing well? We're interested in different areas. Okay? Um, Monics and some frogs, and great ponds. Invasive plants are doing great. Yeah. Curious weeds, widespread weeds. So you can see that when you think in the that was bias and traits, right? So that what it has is on the modern modern selection, um, which by size, migratory, diet, whereas things that come out most survival, water tolerance, lack of dispersal. Here's a summary of that. Now, one thing to note is that this selection constraints put on things for under modern human extinctions and might not be the same as in past extinctions, right? So we might think that large body size is generally a good thing, right? Um, but perhaps being white, perhaps rapidly dispersal is not as important as past extinctions, okay? And that's why that table of fossil versus modern is interesting to see where there's a difference. Yeah. Uh, CMTP is having a very narrow range. Um, I, feel, I don't know, I forget Topi, what the, what the root of that is. I, I'll look at it from there. Okay. So we've seen this plot before, right? looking at distribution of body size okay, in mammals. Right? And we don't see a normal distribution. We see the people who have a sort of tail, who go deeply out, and go to the other side. And so, this is a very simple model where, to explain this, explain this pattern, where as you species, we tend to increase in body size. Right here. Not always, we can get down, but we tend to increase. And then there's a minimum body size, and then there's um interpretation of the high body size. Okay. And so here it is the distribution body size model. Uh, increasing shift in size. And using those simple parameters, they fit them to fit these data points. Um, and <coughs> here's what life is like, the line, and here's their model, the dotted line. And in many cases, um, we fit the right? We do have four assumptions. So body size, positive, positive increase in body size at Instruments, um, science and fiction, and the bias is a bit bigger and smaller. Okay. And here we can do a block of the assumptions, we have to listen to the block. And if you think of these four assumptions, you can get the different way to do that. It's a pretty simple model. Okay. Another question asked about extinction is why do things go extinct? Right? Why don't things just adapt? Okay. Um, why aren't things everywhere? Okay. And 
A related question that people look at, can look at for, for evidence is range sizes. Right? So what keeps certain plants from going further north or further south than they do? Right? Why don't they just adapt to the conditions there and keep spreading? Okay. And one idea is that um, gene flow prevents local adaptation. Let me explain what this means. Well, what's local adaptation? Local adaptation Okay, what's adaptation? Say, say it again? Mm -hmm. Right, and changing how, like via what process? Is it like plasticity? It's nat it's nat natu the natural selection. Right? So you them to an offspring, they vary, some do better than others, they pass those traits on to their offspring, and so forth. Okay? So it's just basic natural selection. Okay? Um, so if the optimum is here, okay, we expect the body size to evolve to the optimum control of the place. Right? We don't see that. Okay. So how could gene flow play a role in this? And so one thought is that, you know, this sort of process can limit adaptation. Okay. We can look at it and see, you know, is, is this actually happening in real life? What sort of processes limit adaptation in this way? Okay. And so <coughs> this shows one way where things can go extinct. You know, they're going extinct locally out here because of gene flow from the center. Okay. Is the whole population going extinct? No. It doesn't do it from the center too much. Okay. And Tell us, like, so, so what, and then so we can look and see what they're, what's happening to them there and figure out something about extinction processes. Okay? And here's just some outstanding questions about um, what happens at the margins of species, what happens at those, at those extremes, okay, which I'll let you read later on online. Okay? Okay. So <coughs> now to the, you know, should we let pandas go extinct part of the lecture? Right? So the, well, that's very snazzy. Um, yes, so the question of what to save and also looking at causes of risk. Okay, so let's get the first one first. Okay, so I want to say to you, okay, we have two areas. One we're going to bulldoze to put up a football stadium. One we're going to save, right? Which one should we save? And each dot represents the species. It's not as hard as it seems. <laughs> oh, more species, right. Okay. How about now? <laughs> I mean, that can see these are all frogs. The frog, the candle, the lion, the elephant. Right. Still five versus four. 
We seem to be hesitating. Okay, good. Yes, good. So, so, let, so let me let me specify it more because that's a good that's a good way to think about it. Yes, let me s say that you know if like the, any species you see is going to go completely extinct. What if, if we do this? Okay, yeah, but otherwise your your thinking is great. I mean about the range size. Yeah. So, which one do we save? Why? Save the frog. But why? I mean, lions play a very important role in controlling you know zebra outbreaks. Why does Josh eat yellow elephants sometimes? <laughs> right, so you're using sort of human values to decide. Okay, good. What else? Does anyone think we should save B? Right, over A? Panda haters. Okay. <laughs> so here are the phylogenetic trees for these species. How does this influence your world? Let's, let's lop off the parts, to, like the root, the stem branches. Okay. So this gives you any information. Or see what kind. You're, you're right. That's good. Yeah. So, if you think about this as sort of evolutionary history, right? This is a lot more than this area. Out of all these branches, a bunch of histories represented by the species, it's a lot smaller than these. So, we have fewer species here, more evolutionary history. And so this is a measure I want to start talking about a little bit. We call this phylogenetic diversity. Okay, what you can do is just add up, take your area B, add up everything there, okay, add, up, add up all the branch lakes there, okay, and that's just known as phylogenetic diversity. Okay, and why is this relevant to macroevolution class? Well, we're into like evolutionary history here. This is a way of looking at evolutionary history and putting it into a context where it helps affect conservation decisions. Okay. So here's an example of this. <coughs> so here are some crabs in Sri Lanka. Okay. And um, we have information on where they're located in Sri Lanka. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And this shows about Right, and so um, actually, we go back. Yeah. Um, so we'll up and show high species richness, while low limb shows the great flooding for two plot. Okay, and also it shows you know the you know the you know, the IUCN status for for this. So Okay, so it's just a way of looking at things as representative of the actual lineages rather than as just numbers of species. Okay. Because <coughs> you know not all species are, are independent. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We can also do is um, Use information to figure out what's correlated with extinction of smart and modern diets. Right? So if, if 
Let's say we don't care about figuring out which species is conserved, we just care about looking at which factors lead to extinction risk. We can also use these sort of approaches for that too. Okay, so we have a, a phylogeny of species, and then there's information about extinction risk. Okay. <coughs> we can look at these scores. Um, what was that? This is actually still with ranking. So here we can do this to figure out how much history is relevant for each species and how much they are fit. And so you can prioritize those species that have the most risk and have the most history represented in them. Right? So saving a panda rather than saving yet another small squirrel species. Or something. Okay. Okay. And <coughs> you know, looking at the utility of this is that this way of you know, ranking species and finding out. So there's lots of species that are endangered. This is like what you pick out. All these are endangered animals in a lot of history. It could be interesting processes which could be evolutionary um, potential for the future, right? So a bear that eats only plants, like pandas, could be interesting for the future. So allows you to do prioritization that way. Okay, let's make sure you get this in practice. Here's a good question. So you have $8 million to save species. How do you save the most? So most species. You may use calculators if you're willing to see on the embarrassment. Just species. Just species, yeah. And so if you're answering here, you can say, it's Is it working? Yes, good, 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 sorry. Yeah. And the channel's 41 for Evolution Fund. You can, spend, you can spend up to $8 million. So, for example, I were to choose option A, I spend 5 plus 2 plus $7 million. And most of you know that too. <laughs> I'll give you one more minute. All right, I want your answer. Okay. <coughs> so, here's what you folks said. So many of you only managed to, manage to save two species, but some of you can do the math and save three. Good. All right. Next question. Okay. Which one saves the most history? So they have eight million dollars. Yep.
Wait one more minute. All right, so let's actually work through this. All right, so for A, how much history am I saving? That is four plus one plus three plus three, which is okay. See, five plus six plus one plus three. D. Yeah. All right. History is represented by having people one and two say. So we have the position here. This one. All things happen along here. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. I'm the same person. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I was wrong to mock you guys doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Because he, um, typically you do this, you get some sort of crowd in the pages, so not the whole time, because the stems are open to the way all the way back to the middle of the right? So you typically only include, um, you know, the most recent one that's written all those seven branches. But you're right, it does save the branches of the history, too. It would otherwise be lost. So, when you're comparing it well, to this, you could. Questions about this? And this is one of the questions where it's two points for any answer. So, relax. But you see how you count up, add up the branch lines to get PD. All right. So that's you know just another way to look at for conservation. Let's look at causes of risk. We want to figure out okay, why are things going extinct now? Why are things at risk now? So, <coughs> here we're looking at these inferences from this paper. Okay. So, rather than sort of postulating the freedom class, we actually looked to find correlations of controlled climate impact. Why did you do that? Why did you put it on independence? So, they did this, when they did these analyses, Figure out in species with small litters have a higher extinction risk. That sort of thing. One thing you could do was just make a table and say, "Here's my here's my extinction stature. So here's endangered. Here's this concern. Here's endangered. Here's these here's this concern, and so forth. And then start putting traits here. So I can say, you know, endotherm, ectotherm, ectotherm, endotherm." Say large area, small area, large area, small area. I really the traits are for the species, and then just look for correlations. Right? What's wrong with doing that? Is 
This is Dr. LaFalge in the next lecture. You should, you should guys. So if I, if I taught you properly, you should start feeling sort of itchy. It's sort of a, it's like something's not right. There's a, there's a disturbance in the force. Okay, we can do that. So, ladies, they take their species, okay, <coughs> and they look for the, and they put on their conservation status, okay, um, and they look for correlations, right? So, maybe this one's on the east side of the river, maybe this one, these can eat thistle, maybe these use lookouts, okay, and so forth, okay? And if we have actually a bigger tree, <coughs> we can start to use this information. So what you might do naively again is just something like this. Okay. We're going to do a correlation with a subset of right, so you have bad endangered, not endangered, these are in the west, these are in the east. Okay, so river. So okay, look. Difference there. Right? So it must be the inside of the river that causes the problem. Okay, and I can draw a line. Okay, that's what, that's what that's, that's the sort of naive approach I was talking about here. Okay, um, but what they did instead was take the conservation status, take data about these animals. Okay, um, take a tree and then do a phylogenetic regression. So, and there are various ways of doing this, um, which we haven't gotten into much. We talked about independent contrast a little bit, but there are other ways that we haven't gotten into that you don't need to know for this class. Um, just need to know for general overall health. Um, but basically, it's a way of dealing with of incorporating the phylogeny into this analysis. Okay. So, what's wrong with this sort of thing? We have a whole, yeah, remember, we have a whole bunch of points here. So the problem with this sort of approach is it over counts. Right? So we have one origin of this, and then one origin of you know, the having low, having you know, the curvy nature of the And so I think it's more than one, it's not five. Okay. This is our independent. Okay. And it could be that even this also causes this situation. Or it could be that the new dust causes this all these things happen in the same branch. Okay. It could be a change from a C to a T at the good definition of 2005 and 900. Right? Who knows? <coughs> if they have a couple of times, you can figure that out that approach. Here, we have this one example. So, what to do is control for this non independence. Okay? Does it make sense? Do um, you remember the leaf longevity example? Right? Big leaves that live a short time, which makes sort of not much sense, right? But what it is, is that angiosperms have big, short leaf, short lived leaves, and pines and relatives have small, long lived leaves, right? So only one, one change. And it could have been that big evolved here and long life evolved here, right? But you have lots of species, it looks like a ton of data points. I should just chew. There's a new control for that. Okay. 
Same thing with this. So can you explain to me what they Yeah. Yep. Um, the simplest way to understand it <coughs> is to, and in their exact method, it is hard to explain, but let me give you a related method that they could be used. Easier to explain. Um, they call it independent contrasts, right? And so it's like doing sister group, it's, it's similar to doing sister group comparisons. Why do we, why do we use sister group comparisons? Mm -hmm. Right, it's like doing identical twin studies. They're common up to that branching point, and then they're, they're, they're diverging separately. So it's like doing sister comparisons, but over the entire tree. So what you can do is rather than is compare this taxon to this taxon. Okay? And that's one comparison. Then you can compare this taxon to this taxon. Okay? And this taxon to this taxon. Okay? Is that all the comparisons you can make? No. Right. So what you want to do. We have all this history here we haven't used yet. Okay. What we do with independent contrast is we then compare, we reconstruct this ancestor, okay. and then compare that to this. Okay. So that way changes happening on this, these two branches can be looked at. Okay. And now I estimate this ancestor, compare this to that. Okay. This ancestor to this ancestor. And this ancestor, this ancestor. Okay. And so we go from having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight you know, data points that we can correlate to having one, two, three, four, five, six, seven comparisons. Okay. So we lose we lose one comparison, but we've now only used each branch of the tree once. So we don't have to worry about a multiple multiple test problem. Okay. So if we're doing it on this tree, we can compare these two and say, okay, they're both endangered, they're both endangered, they're both endangered, okay. Compare these two, they're both endangered, they're both endangered, they're both endangered, compare this is such a lithium sister, this is endangered, it's both endangered, there's no changes, okay, compare that to this, same thing, we can do it right here, boom, boom, and then I can do one change here, right? Now I realize it's only one comparison. Well, one comparison shows that the endangered correlates with being on the east side and being this little thing to look at. Right? That's one, one of the comparisons. Only this point did have that change. Right? So now we know, rather than sort of overcounting this by just being the pieces we have here, we just have one comparison out of, whatever it is, um, out of six okay? that tells us that, rather than seven out of seven. Because okay, so we're not misled. Uh, that's why you need to control for that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Does the, does the method make sense? There's some um, tiny bits here I've overlooked, I've, I've skipped, so actually we have to do just to lengthen this branch a little bit, you can by branch length and things like that. You don't have to deal with it right now, it's just I mean, the basic contrast which you should learn about. Yep. So how do we construct the ancestor? So who knows what the central limit theorem is? Yeah, or a stats, basically. Almost. So it falls in the middle, like what what sort of, what do you get out, basically? A normal, right. So central limit theorem says you get add, add a whole bunch of random stuff together. You get a normal distribution. Okay? And if you're in an intro stats class, they'll say, okay, I want you to add a bunch of things that are this sort of, this sort of exponential distributions. Okay? Pull a bunch of random exponential numbers up, up and then add them together. What do you get? You get a normal. Okay? 
It's beautiful, it's weird, it's wonderful, it's employs all this, a lot of stats. Okay? So the idea is we just have a whole bunch of random independent factors that have, you know, under some requirements like, you know, finite variability, finite variance and that sort of thing. We get a normal out. Okay? What's evolution? Well, how species evolve? <laughs> the, the, the practice of evolution involves a lot of statistics. How about the actual process of things evolving? What happens to them? Well, okay, I'm, I'm a species, I have this body size, right? And now, I, you know, those of me, those, those members of my population that are bigger have more mates. So my body size increases. Okay, but now I'm in a place where bigger ones don't have enough food. The body size decreases, right? And so through time, my body size keeps evolving through these little changes, right? So keep adding, get bigger, get smaller, get bigger, get smaller, which may make me get normal. Okay? <coughs> so given a long enough time, if I know it starts here, where it ends up after that amount of time is a normal distribution. Okay? And the rate of the the rate of those wiggles times time tells me how much how wide my variance is. Okay? So this basic normal distribution. And so <coughs> when we do constructions, we basically use a model called Brownian motion, okay, which comes from this normal distribution. So it comes from a guy who looked up pollen grains in water. And they're, you know, they're small, they're able to water molecules, and they're getting hit around, right? moving back and forth, and they move in a Brownian motion process. Okay? So same thing here. So we use <coughs> a multivariate normal, basically, so it's a normal distribution but for multiple observations to reconstruct these ancestors. Good question. Any other questions about this? Because they've taught this many times, it's the first time we're getting these good questions, so that's it. Okay. Um. okay. And <coughs> one thing you can do is, one, so they get these, you know, loadings, get these predictor values. Okay. So, direct the range, you know, bigger range, smaller, less interest. Right? Bigger islands. Okay. Okay, about this is, you know, how do you know whether something's endangered or not? Well, you send someone out, you count the individuals, look at threats in the environment, all that stuff, a lot of work, right? We already have these tables, it looks like the males in the world, we have all the information about where they live and that sort of thing, but not population size. Well, if we, make, if we can do these regressions, we can then find out, we can say, okay, let's look at the males in the world, you have a small liver size, and you have a um, big interest. Okay. So let's predict your extinction risk. Okay. So <coughs> what they did with this is, you know, first of all, you can do, you know, here's the observed threat level for these known species, and here's the predicted threat level. And so yep, there's some noise. Especially at higher threat levels. If you have species with, you don't know what a sweat thrill is, you can still predict what it is without actually having to study the species. Okay, and you can go in and say, we don't know what it is, but it's probably going to be pretty high, so let's go check it out. Okay. Okay. <coughs> and here is something similar, looking at what's going to happen with climate change. Okay. So black is range expansion with climate change, and other colors are range contraction with climate change. Um, the way they plot this is not ideal. They look like it's mostly black, but you can turn into all the black. Okay. What you look at is the tips, and how many tips are not black. We can also look at things like phylogenetic diversity through time. So, we find that we're seeing different groups, plants, birds, and mammals, and under different potential scenarios. Right, so plants, you have a lot of attention, and you don't need a lot of health insurance. Right, so don't need a lot of attention on plants. But birds, you have to have lots, lots of chunks of bird diversity. And it's the same thing in geographic context. Okay. We can see, we can see a lot of diversity of plants, 
actually gets better in some places. Um, and then bird and so you've got some material companies for using key taps in terms of function, uh, evolutionary history. Right. Other questions about this? Okay. Good. Um, one thing to note, remember I do have a feedback form on my website. So if you go to brianomero.info slash feedback, you can give me anonymous comments. Okay? So you can say everything's great, you can say this part's awful, I want to know who it is, and then they can improve the class. Okay? So do let me know about that. All right? okay. Anything else? All right, good, thank you.